A few years ago, the, the, the former front bent politician, Michael Portillo, hosted a series of televised dinner parties. And during one of these uh, dinner parties, he explained what had attracted him to politics. And the way he put it was that in politics, you get to work with such a big canvas. And, and that phrase struck in my, stuck in my memory. And we feel a little bit the same as, as managers of small company funds. Uh, one of the things we absolutely love about this job is that we get to work with, not just with such a big canvas, and you've seen a little bit of it today, but to work with it in real close-up. And, and we, we, we live and breathe the companies we invest in, and our, our fortunes and futures are kind of tied up with theirs in some ways. Um, and, and these companies are operating in all the continents of the world, they're in all the industries, all the major industry sectors. Um, and, and the beauty of small companies is they're always doing new things. And, and it's, it's the, it, we're always learning about what's coming down the pipeline in, in different sectors and, and different industries. So for example, with, with DXI, the first company you saw today, um, what, what's really going on with DXI is there's, there's a major change going on in, uh, in something as basic as the telephone. In that you, if you're in business, you, don't, you just don't need a telephone anymore, the physical thing, the plastic that sits on your desk. You just need a pair of headphones that plug into your computer, and, and it's much more convenient, and once you get used to it, it's, it's, it, you forget that you ever had a telephone. So it's that kind of it, it, fundamental industry changes. And that's quite, it's quite a small, very specific niche, but of course it has major ramifications for products that get bought and sold, and major new requirements for engineering and software. And so we, 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 um, we love working with small businesses and, and, and our role as, as small company investors, really, because um, it's, it's this big canvas that we have to work with. And we, we, of course, never forget that it's really thanks to you, our investors, that we're able to um, play this role and the trust you place in us as, as fund managers. Uh, and hopefully today is a bit of an expression of our appreciation of that. We, we love getting your feedback, and uh, actually one of the, one of the um, bits of genesis of today, one of the origins of today, was a shareholder who wrote to us and said, why have you never held an investor um, showcase around your AGM? And when we thought about that question, we thought, well, actually, there's no very good reason why we don't do that. Uh, clearly, when we started Amati four or five years ago, uh, we were running flat out in many ways, but we just expanded our team when we had this email come in, and we thought, this is a great idea, and it put the thought in our minds. And, and so I, I hope you'll, we'll contact you. I think Rachel will be contacting you after the event, and we'll be asking for your feedback, and we do value it, and, uh, and look forward to receiving your comments. Um, we, we live in an age of pretty heavily staged managed communications, and uh, I, I, I don't know if this is your experience of things, but you know, what's possible to say in public is always restricted, and of course, you know, we're a regulated business. A lot, of, a lot of the companies in our portfolio, we know more about than we're allowed to tell you often. Um, and I, I do remember when, a couple of years ago, I went to a conference in Edinburgh that was put on by the CFA Society, that stands for the Chartered Financial Analysts Institute, and I'm a member of it, and, and they hosted their annual worldwide conference in Edinburgh, which is the first time they've ever done that. I thought, it's great, this is a good opportunity to go along. And uh, the talk I remember best from that uh, few days I went was, um, was a talk by a gentleman called Malam Sanusi Lamido Sanusi. And he was, he was the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria at the time. And uh, he started by explaining uh, that he, and we, had, we had handouts for each talk. We haven't done handouts today. We've got certain bits of paper, not whole handouts. But we had the whole presentations given to us. We had this 50-page slide pack. And he started by saying, his people back home, whenever he went abroad, they always put together him this wonderful pack of information. It's everything that you'd expect a central banker to say, stuff full of economic data on Nigeria and this, that, and the other. And he then said, well, I'm not going to talk about any of that. And, and so he sort of turned the projector off. He said, what I'm going to tell you about is how I've been tackling corruption in Nigeria for the last three years. And that, that obviously couldn't be written down. And, uh, <laughs> Um, in, and he was a, one of the bravest and uh, most sort of courageous public figures I've, I've ever seen. And this talk was just amazing. And it was amazing because of its candor. Um, and as, as an aside, I should say, I looked him up uh, in, 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 in preparing this and uh, found that President Goodluck Jonathan fired him in February 
uh, sadly, because he'd been a supporter of his, and, uh, but he'd, he'd um, started to uncover an alleged $20 billion fraud that related to some of the president's friends to do with the state oil company. Very sad, but he got fired. Um, but as a consolation to him, he was, uh, he was then crowned Emir of Kano's. He was obviously from, he's, he's now referred to as His Royal Highness. So he, I think it actually helped me explain a little bit why he had the courage to take on what were quite, actually quite dangerous um, opponents in Nigeria. So we want to be candid today as much as we can be. And um, that means starting by saying that yeah, investment requires making predictions about the future. And uh, in some making any predictions like that, of course, they're not reliable. And um, we, you know, very often investments that, that we have the most conviction about and we think are going to do the best turn out to be the ones that make us look like lemons. And ones that we thought, well, we'll have, you know, that looks interesting enough, we'll put it in the portfolio, turn out to be the best ones. Um, foresight is extremely difficult, in, in, and, and, and we're in the business of trying to look forwards. And, and again, it's one of the other things that I think makes our job as engaging as it is, uh, analysing the past, analysing the present, and trying to make some kind of um, uh, sense out of what might be coming down the pipe. Um, it's a, it's a difficult business, and of course, you know, we, we make mistakes, as, as does everybody in this business. So I, I hope we stand before you today with a, a modest and hopefully realistic view as to what we can achieve as fund managers. We don't have any magical powers to remove the risks that are inherent in making investments. However, we, we believe that by judgment and negotiation, and we, and we do a lot of negotiating in our business, um, that we can... Um, make sensible decisions and, 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 and put together a portfolio has, that has a well-balanced and well-thought-out um, uh, 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 basket of risks in there which, which will produce reasonable and, and, and good returns over a period of time. Uh, and, and I hope the other aspect of VSTs which I, I particularly like is, is that the legislation requires us to invest 70% of the money that you place with us in newly issued shares from companies. And so, if you like, we get involved in companies at a very important point in their, in their life cycle, which is when they're raising capital. And it's when they're raising capital that they're most open to change, actually. So if you go to a company that's doing just fine, it's got all the money it needs, and you say, well, you could improve this, or why don't you change your board, or why don't you think about corporate governance now, or you know, what about this bit, it looks a bit messy, they're not very likely to listen. But when companies are raising capital, they're very open, and, and um, it's possible as an investor at that point, if you're ever going to influence a company, that's when you do it. And, and it's in the nature of the legislation that, that operates the, the VCTs that we are dealing with companies the most at that very critical point. And I, I think the, the, the one message we would really love you to go away with is that actually what, that, what your money does when it goes into these companies, it makes a very positive impact on those businesses. And, and the, um, the VCT industry in general, I think, is, is uh, now pretty well set up to make a very positive impact on small businesses in the UK. And certainly the government's done a lot over the last few years to make sure that VCTs um, don't stray away from being focused on investing in real businesses, making a, a real impact on the economy around them. So with, with the money that we give companies you know, we don't give it to them, we invest in them, uh, new things happen and, and things become possible that otherwise wouldn't be possible and, and things that would remain dreams start to turn into reality. So what, what I thought we'd do today is, is try and give you a flavour, in order to give you a flavour A of the rest of the portfolio with some of the other companies we haven't talked about today and also to give you a sense of uh, where we sit and where we sit is a place where lots and lots of companies are coming to us all the time saying, we've got this company, we think, you should, do you want to invest in this one, do you want to invest in this one? Um, and, and at the moment when the AIM market is very, very active, as it has been for the last 18 months, <clears throat> the number of companies that are approaching us has, has skyrocketed. And it's meant that we, we are constantly um, having to run very fast to keep up. Um, to give you a flavour of this, I, I sort of tried to come up with some categories. And so we can sort of group companies to give you the, the sort of categorisation of the kind of things we see. And uh, so the first category I, I've come up with here is what I call pie in the sky. And, and this is very common. And, and, and 
it, it, it's a little bit tongue in cheek. I'm not meaning to be rude about it as a category. Um, pie in the sky companies um, come up with, are pursuing an extraordinary idea in general. This is how I characterize them. And they're, they're either on the bleeding edge of research uh, or they are, if you think about natural resources, um, they're in the early stage of exploring for copper in Peru somewhere, or um, they might be um, preclinical drug discovery. Um, it, it, but they're, they're characterized by um, uh, a, a dream that's a long way off, and it's expensive to get there. Um, and typically, of course, what happens in practice with, with these companies is that um, as, as, the, uh, as the time draws on, um, the pie tends to get smaller as it gets nearer, and also gets more expensive, and also gets a little bit higher up. So it's a difficult journey with, the, with a company like this. And, and um, of course, the way I've characterized this, you might say, well, why would we ever bother with anything like this? It's, it, it, and it is very difficult, and, and I, I have to say we don't do much of it. But in its defense, I should say that you know, most of the, we, the UK is a, a fantastic country for innovation and research and development. And you know, most of the best research that we see starts off in companies that look like this. And, and so uh, we never rule anything out. And, and we hear a, a, you know, a lot of incredible, about a lot of incredible work that's going on. And we have to decide when to join the journey. And I suppose typically for us, we, we're not set up to join this journey very near the beginning. Uh, and we don't have deep enough pockets. And um, we're, we're, it's not, we don't see that as the right, uh, the, 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 the right um, uh, approach for the VCTs. However, we will sometimes think about joining this journey when it's been going for some years. And uh, thinking about the, the portfolio at the moment, um, I can, I'm just trying to come up with some examples of this. We have a company called Egden Resources, which was a, a, unusually a, an onshore UK oil and gas company. And um, it's actually not done, it, it didn't do anything that I was hoping it was going to do. It was very disappointing in many ways, and, and, and onshore UK oil and gas is very difficult. And suddenly, it's brought into its business model a bit of pie in the sky, which is it now owns a lot of the acreage across the um, Midlands uh, in England, uh, which is really the, the most prospective and potential ground for um, the shale gas industry. Of course, this is really a long way off. It's going to be expensive. But significantly, they brought in a, very, a major partner. And this, generally speaking, what pie in the sky companies need to do early on is find a large multinational business to come and join them and pay, and pay for the journey. And that's in a way what Egdon's done. And uh, Egg, the Egdon share price um, rose very dramatically on that news. Uh, and, and we were actually able to trim our holding very profitably. So it turned into, what had turned into a not very clever investment became a very good investment. We still carry um, uh, some of that. And, and um, you know, it, it remains an ongoing question in our mind how we see this industry developing. A couple of other quick examples, um, just to give you the flavor of how, you know, why we might think about this and, what, and, and, and when we might join the journey. Uh, we more recently made a very small investment, sub 1%, probably 0.6, something like that, in a company called Illica. And Illica is a materials discovery business that came out of the University of Southampton and um, phenomenally clever science. And they've been involved in um, the search for a number of different uh, new materials over the last years. When it floated, it was far too early for us. Uh, earlier this year, they announced um, quite convincingly that they had discovered the material technology to make the first solid state batteries. And of course, that's if true and if, if confirmed later in the year, uh, that's a really major breakthrough. Solid state batteries. Um, and by solid, I mean that the battery has no liquid electrolyte inside. Um, solid state batteries have huge advantages over liquid electrolyte. And so here, here we've got a company that's had this dream. It started pursuing it maybe five years ago, maybe six years ago. And we think it's now the, the pie has come into sight and it's started to take some shape. And so we put a small investment in. These will never be very big investments in these teas. Um, that's probably enough on that. Well, second category is... The, I call the best thing since sliced bread. And I suppose, it, in, in a sense, this is now looking a little bit, when, when that original vision starts to become real, and you then have a real product, you're selling it to real businesses, you know, what you then hopefully have is the best thing since sliced bread in that particular industry. 
And uh, I, I think um, hopefully you've seen that a little bit with Quixent. Uh, Quixent's probably moved on a little bit beyond this stage, but companies will go when they've invented something new and they've been through that long stage of discovery and R&D, bringing it to market. When it starts to get adopted, um, it can be very exciting because you're bringing something that people really want to the market. You still have a lot of other hurdles to overcome. Uh, are people really going to buy it? it might, slice bread might be great, but people are used to chopping their own. Are they, how are you going to tell them that, that this is better and more convenient, maybe cheaper? Um, and so we, we have a lot of companies. This is, this is quite sort of meat and drink to the VCT. Uh, and I've put a few just slides here just to run through them. Hard-eyed, it's a, quite a large holding in an RT VCT. Uh, it's a, mainly a convertible loan. Um, this company had um, invented many, many years ago a process for the chemical deposition of tungsten carboid onto, onto steel, and uh, it allows that super hard coating to be used in all sorts of ways it couldn't be before. Um, it's taken a long time, I have to say, for, for this to really pick up, and we had to, at one point, a number of years ago, rescue the company, and actually the rescue has proven really worthwhile, and it's been that, that rescue investment that we made has been a very good one for the VCT. Um, we have... Uh, here's the business, Ubisense. Um, this was a, a business we actually invested a little bit pre-IPO and again at the IPO. Um, their main new invention is um, what one is best described as indoor GPS systems. So it's a very exact positioning systems that can be used inside a warehouse. And uh, they've found um, very uh, successful and, and quite rapid adoption amongst the global automotive manufacturing industry. So the car, what, what's going on in this factory is that um, they're assembling cars and when, when the vehicle enters a certain space, which is defined as you can see there in the image by the blue box, um, anybody who carries a tool into that space, that tool will be automatically calibrated to the vehicle that's in front of them. So the torque will be exactly right. Uh, there won't be, what used to happen before this is you'd have to go to a barcode scanner scan in the setting for this vehicle and make sure you got it right. Sometimes there'd be mistakes and you'd get a bolt that was done up to the wrong, uh, the wrong level of tightness and, uh, and the car might fail. So this, the, 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 the car manufacturers uh, have, have clearly recognised the benefits of this particular sliced bread and, and uh, it's, it's, it's gone right across the globe. Um, here's a company, Sabian Technology. Uh, this one, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly simple proposition this, bit, this product called the M2G is designed for commercial boilers. And what it does is when you, you, you add it onto a commercial boiler and, and it takes over the management of that boiler and it, it simply stops something called dry cycling, it stops the boiler coming on when it doesn't really need to. It's monitoring all the thermostat settings in the buildings. And uh, just doing that can save the user between 10 and 25% of their gas usage. So it's, it, it's, it's a very quick payback on buying the product. Uh, this business you'll see in the, in the portfolios, bo both of them, uh, Mycelax, was an IPO from maybe two years ago. And it's, uh, it's a business which is involved in what's called water polishing in the oil and gas industry. And water polishing is where, when you're exploring for oil, maybe out at sea, um, you, you have to use quite a lot of water and you're bringing up quite a lot of water with the oil. You can't just throw that water back into the sea full of oil. You have to clean it up. And cleaning, uh, cleaning the water up is difficult. And the higher the standards get that you want to set for cleaning it up, the more difficult it becomes. And Mycelex have brought to market pretty much the best water polishing. It's for that last bit where it turns from that kind of brownie color to really clear water. That's the bit they do. Uh, there, there are no equivalents that are as good. And their unit, if you fit it on an offshore oil rig, is much smaller than the competition. So it's quite a good bit of sliced bread, and it's finding um, it's finding a good level of take-up. Uh, I suppose one of the issues that all of these companies have is just how long does it take the customers to buy the product? And you might, you might bring an industry, the most fantastic innovation, um, and, and some industries will simply take 10 years to start buying it. It's, you know, they're, they're, some of these industries move very, very, very slowly. The oil and gas industry is one of those industries. It's very slow to take a new product, to adopt a new product. And my selects have been at it for probably five years when we met them. And um, they're now at a point where this is starting to spread and it begins to snowball. Uh, and, and the beauty of this investment from our point of view is, is um, that 
when they make a sale, they sell a piece of equipment, but really what they're selling you is a consumable. So this is really a razor blade uh, 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 kind of model where the, the initial sale to the customer is then matched almost every year by a similar amount in the consumable products that they use to, for the filters, effectively, to, to polish the water. Uh, Fox Marble, I won't dwell on this. This is a company, a recent IPO. Um, I sit on the board of this company. It was pretty much a startup when we invested in it. So it kind of, you could say it started in the pie in the sky category. We're now, I'm happy to say, producing marble and selling it. Um, and hopefully this is going to be regarded as a, we're, hopefully we'll be bringing good sliced bread to market. Uh, we, we think this marble deposits, it, it, the, the, the deposits are mostly in Kosovo, some of them are in Macedonia. We think this is one of the last um, virgin world-class marble areas in the world, and that's why we've become so interested in it. Um, so then, next type of investment proposition, category three, I've, I've called it better, faster, cheaper, and I suppose what I'm really getting at here, this is when products begin to be, if you like, sitting on the supermarket shelf, when they're getting wider adoption, and really what is then uh, what they're selling to a, a much bigger audience is they're either better, faster, or cheaper than the competition. And, uh, you know, and this really begins to fall, this is where we get the core of the, um, of the, the VST portfolios. And I'll go, go through some of the ones that characterize this. Spiregis uh, investment in MRT VST. Uh, for a long time, actually, this investment did absolutely nothing for us, but that's because it was on OFFEX, it wasn't on AIM, and OFFEX, everyone ignored it. Um, but actually, the business has been doing, making fabulous progress for the last 10 years. It's just in share price terms, most of the pro that progress was reflected only in the last six months. Um, but they make, effectively, they make fire alarms and carbon monoxide alarms. And they make them um, a little bit better than the competition, more different. They, when, they came, when they originally floated, I think it was 2000, on OFFEX in 2001, something like that. I remember them coming to the office I was in at the time. And they, they just developed a smoke alarm that you could plug into a light fitting to get around the problem that um, these things, the batteries run out. And when the batteries run out, you, you've got a problem. Um, they made one that you could just plug into the light fitting and it would fit around the bulb so the battery would never run out. Simple as that. But it, got, it gave them an edge. They got into B&Q, been in B&Q for ages. They've now got good European distribution. And uh, in December, one of their uh, distributors actually bid for them. And it was sitting on OFFEX. It was way too cheap, the share price. They've gone up from 20p to 60p, and they bid 90p. And I think we, like all the shareholders, had a look at it and thought, there's absolutely no way we'd sell this business for 90p. And so we went to them and encouraged them to float on AIM, which they did um, a couple of months back. And um, the current share price, just to give you the flavour, is it's about £2.50. And, and we still think it's a good investment, so we're, 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 we're holders of this one. Um, Accesso, this is a, a large investment in Marty BCT2, um, um, and one of the ones that when, when we originally took over the management of Victory VCT, this was a small holding, but we, we were fortunate enough to know one of the non-executive directors on the board. And for a long time, this had been a lifestyle business, and it was, didn't really look like it was going anywhere, but we managed to pick up that, that this was a very, very promising business, which had, was starting to change itself, and, and they pointed a uh, a new chief executive um, who's proven to be fabulous. And uh, we, we, we invited him along today, actually, because he's a, he's a brilliant presenter and one of the best um, salespeople we, we, you'll ever meet. Um, but he's done a fantastic job with this business. And um, he, what, what they realised is that this company is, is in the business of electronic queuing. And in fact, it, it owns the global patents for electronic queuing. And that, their, their market is really um, primarily theme parks. Um, but I think it will grow beyond this in due course. But at the, at, as things stand, uh, if you go to, say, Legoland in London, um, you'll be offered the chance to pay quite a substantial premium price in order to have an electronic queuing device that will let you go on lots more rides than you otherwise could. And from Legoland's point of view, I suppose, from a business point of view, they're trying to segment their customer base to see who doesn't mind paying more for less queuing. And uh, it, you know, it allows them to, as all supermarkets do, you have premium products and you have more discounted products. Um, and, and when the theme park started to realize the value this brought them, because it, it does create quite a lot of value for them, it's been adopted and it's all over the world. Well, it's only in America, Europe. Uh, they're still fairly early days in the Far East. And then quite very sensibly what they did is they used the platform they had 
to acquire a couple of other businesses. One of them was called Accesso. And this business was originally called LowQ, in, in case you don't remember it. Um, but in, in America, they don't know what a Q is. Q is just a letter. So it was called LowQ. And, and people don't queue in America. They stand in line. So the, the name didn't work. Um, so they, they, they bought, in order to get around that problem, they bought a company called Accesso. And uh, Accesso is uh, the world leader, really, for um, online um, payment systems for theme parks. So if you, if you want to pre... What you're really encouraged to do, if you're going to go to Legoland or wherever, it's a much better idea to pre-book so you don't get there and then spend the first hour <coughs> waiting to buy your ticket. And Accesso does all that pre-booking. And what they're really good at, of course, is when you're, when you're pre-booking, they're very good at upselling you other things. So you might buy... A, queue, a speedy queuing kind of thing, or you might buy your parking space, you might be buy your lunch or some other things. You might de decide to buy a season ticket if they're really good at their job. Uh, so, and then more recently, they've made another acquisition uh, which takes them into the area of um, what we call ERP software, enter enterprise resource planning software, uh, which is really the software used to run a business. And, and this business they bought in the States um, runs... I think the majority of the ski resorts in America, and it provides that enterprise resource management software. And so this now gives them the opportunity to take that product and sell it to theme parks. And if once they do that, they're then, if you think about it, they're selling them the software they run the whole theme park on, the, pre, the payments and the queuing. And they've started off from one quite small niche area, which is a little bit of a fragile position to be into becoming an absolutely key supplier to their customers. And that's a great journey to go down. Next type of investment proposition, I call these hand-me-downs. Hand-me-downs are what, where, effectively, um, we, you do, we don't see many of these on AIM, but uh, they're, they're, you see a lot of them in the full list. It's where we're getting companies that are already very well formed, that somebody else has put together, a private equity business maybe has put them together, and they're selling them onto the market. And normally, of course, the, the, the hand-me-downs, unlike what they might sound like, these, these are not cheap. These tend to be quite expensive because somebody is, is cleverer than you is selling them to you and they know more about it than you do, and they want a very good price for it. Um, so there aren't a lot of these. They, they might appear in a non-qualifying portfolio. A good example, a recent flotation a couple of days ago, the AA floated. That's a classic hand-me-down investment, a fantastic brand, a great business. Hasn't been terribly well run the last seven years because they haven't, the owner wasn't too focused on it. Um, some people have acquired it, taken it to market. There's category four, they're called Roll Your Own. And these we do, these we do see in the, in the VST. This is where... It's, it's acquisition vehicles, roll-up strategies, and also, importantly, um, brand rollouts. So a lot of retailers, when they start up, you have a good idea. Actually, the business model then is just do more of it. And an uh, example that we've got here is Prezzo, a big holding in a multi T2. That's a classic roll-out strategy. Um, other, other kind of strategies might be roll-up strategies where you enter an industry and you start to buy up key players in it and put together a business that way. We're a bit more wary of those. We prefer the roll-out kind of strategies. And finally, um, I put this category in, what I call Me Too. And this is a category we try to do none of at all. And, and uh, this, uh, Me Too companies, um, they, they're normally jumping on somebody else's bandwagon. And I, I don't know if you remember in the do days of the dot-com boom, <laughs> One of the UK's most successful companies, a little bit controversial as well, was a company called Autonomy. And I happened to see that company three months after it floated and nobody had ever heard of it. Um, but when, when it entered the FTSE 100, only about a year later, um, and it had a market cap of, I don't know, three or four billion pounds, which was way overinflated, of course, lots of other businesses came to market saying, we are um, the next Autonomy. And I heard that a lot. Four or five companies came. And of course, they all went bankrupt. And it's a very dangerous. It's very, very dangerous in, in business to try and um, simply copy somebody else's success. You really need to have your own vision and your own uh, technology, your own ideas. Um, so this is, this is the only category that I, 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 I hope to say we do none of. And if you spot anything in the portfolio that you think is a me too company, please write to me and tell me. <laughs> and just very quickly in conclusion. Why, why are we believers in AIM VCTs? Uh, this is what I think we, we bring in an AIM VCT to the market, a, port, a maturing portfolio of investments already in place. And you can, they come at all those stages from a little bit of pie in the sky, lots of sliced bread, lots of better, cheaper, faster. Um, 
And uh, we, we have, as VC managers, very good access to the IPO market and the secondary placings on AIM. That's our hunting ground. And we think the AIM does attract a lot of really great world-class businesses, and, and it's a good place to be an investor. Um, the, the companies can, as they mature, they achieve scale and liquidity, and that liquidity is very important for us. It means we can continually evolve the portfolio. It's a gradual process. It doesn't have to be uh, one year we suddenly have five exits and we've got to completely start again. With, with an AIM VC, it's a continual process of evolution. And of course, from the market prices, we have valuation transparency in the VCT 